This is African News Tonight on The Voice of America. Hello and welcome. Welcome to VOA Africa. Thank you for joining us. I'm Yehia Suhib in Washington. Here's what's coming up on African News Tonight. Africa is the continent of the future as populations begin to decline in Europe and in Asia. That's VOA, uh, wi- uh, that, uh, William Gla- Glaston, Chair and Senior Fellow in the Brookings Institution's Governance Studies Program. Talking about the possibility President Biden might mention the new U.S.-Africa relations in his State of the Union address tonight. Details coming up. Also, among the survivors pulled from the rubble in Turkey is Ghana footballer Christian Atsu and 16 Nigerian pilgrims were killed while crossing Burkina Faso on their way to Senegal. These stories and more on African News tonight. But first, our top story, Nigerian authorities have vowed to provide justice after armed men in Burkina Faso attacked a group of Nigerian pilgrims on their way to Senegal, killing at least 16. Burkina Faso's military government launched an investigation of yesterday's attack in an area known as uh, Islamist militants. Uh, Timothy Obiezu reports from Abuja, Nigeria. The Nigerian presidency said in a statement that Authorities are in talks with Burkina Faso counterparts and are waiting for the outcome of their probe before they take action. President Muhammad Buhari condemned the killing and expressed his condolences to the families of the victims. Authorities also pledged to secure the remains of the deceased. Nigerian pilgrims were in convoy of buses bound for Kaulak, Senegal, when they were stopped by heavily armed men in military uniforms. The men forced the passengers out of the buses, selected 16 pilgrims at random, and shot them to death. Burkina Faso authorities refute allegations the killers are members of their security forces. Abuja-based Beacon security analyst Kabira Adamu says it may be too early to point a finger. Around 2019 up until now, the intensity of terror attacks in that country has increased tremendously. So seeing persons in military uniform um, may not be enough to conclude that they are, um, you know, state officials, just like it happens in Nigeria. Non-state actors sometimes dress in public security uniforms and come out to, uh, to carry out their atrocity. Burkina Faso and its neighbors, Mali and Niger, have been battling armed groups with links to Al-Qaeda and Islamic State. The fighting is mainly in the country's northern region where hundreds of villagers have been killed and nearly 2 million displaced. Last week, at least 10 civilians were killed in two attacks in the west central town of Dasa. Security analyst Senator Irebu says Nigerian authorities and citizens must take travel advisories seriously. This also boils down to the issue of negligence on the part of the government and uh, ignorance also on the part of the citizens. What kind of travel advisory has the federal government given to the citizens that want to embark on such journey? We know that the Sahel region, all these countries have been embroiled in conflict. It's not clear when Burkina Faso authorities will present the outcome of the probe, but Adamu suggests the Nigerian government could employ multilateral relations to address the problem. We can invite the ambassador of Burkina Faso to Nigeria and request formally for an investigation. The other option is multilateral. Since we are are members of several multilateral platforms, Nigeria can also use that. Number one is ECOWAS, the EU, and then number three is the UN. It's absolutely important that these multilateral platforms are pursued for the simple reason that the issue probably has to do with terrorism. Because that's the major challenge in Burkina Faso. Burkina Faso is also facing growing political instability from two coups in the last year alone. On Tuesday, the United Nations said poverty and the prospect of better paid work rather than ideology are fueling recruitment to jihadists and other violent groups in Africa, casting doubt on assertions that religious doctrine is the main reason for continued trouble. 
Timothy Obiezu for VOA News, Abuja, Nigeria. UN High Commissioner for Refugees, Filippo Grandi, has visited Ethiopia's Tigray region and met with some of those displaced by the two-year conflict. Maya Masekir reports from Addis Ababa, Ethiopia. UN High Commissioner for Refugees, Filippo Grandi, has visited refugees and displaced communities in Ethiopia. The High Commissioner, who arrived in Ethiopia on February 5, has since met with the President of Ethiopia and traveled to capital of Tigray region to meet with families displaced by the conflict. The High Commissioner's trip in Ethiopia also included meeting Eritrean refugees in Alamot camp in Amhara. Eritrean refugees in Ethiopia have faced targeted attacks over the past two years of war. In December, the UNHCR, in collaboration with partners, relocated 7,000 Eritrean refugees from western Tigray to Alamwaj. Though access for aid to Tigray has improved since a peace deal was signed between the federal government and Tigray forces, resources remain limited compared to the high needs, according to a UN report. After the peace agreement, humanitarian agencies can deliver more aid in areas of northern Ethiopia impacted by conflict, said the High Commissioner through a statement made on Twitter. Since the November peace deal, the federal government has restored basic services and humanitarian aid to the region. As part of the deal, Tigrayan fighters have handed over heavy weapons to the federal government, while Amhara special forces have left the Tigray region. On February 3, Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed met with TPLF leaders for the first time to discuss the implementation of the peace deal. Maya Sikar for VOA News, Addis Ababa, Ethiopia. President Biden will deliver his second State of the Union address this evening as the third year of his presidency gets underway. It will be his first address to a divided Congress. William A. Galston is chair in the Brookings Institution's Governance Studies program, where he serves as a senior fellow. He is also the author of nine books and more than 100 articles in the fields of political theory, public policy, and American politics. In talking to me, he first explains what the U.S. State of the Union is all about. The U.S. Constitution says that the president shall, from time to time, provide information to Congress and the American people on the State of the Union. Uh, Early in American history, that took the form of an annual written document delivered to the Congress. Uh, But more than a century ago, President Woodrow Wilson, whom your listeners may recognize as one of the authors of the League of Nations, decided to make the journey from the White House to Capitol Hill, the seat of our Congress, to deliver this message in person. And ever since, with just a few exceptions, on an annual basis, the president appears before the Congress of the United States to deliver a speech uh, describing the state of the country and outlining his legislative and policy plans for the coming year. That is what Mr. Biden our current president, will be doing tonight. You you are an expert in the fields of political theory, public policy, and American politics. So this evening, when President Biden talks to the nation, what do you think he will be talking about, especially in the, in the realm of uh, foreign policy? Well, I am quite sure that Mr. Biden will be talking about the principal defense and security challenges that the United States faces in Europe, particularly the invasion of Ukraine by Russia, and in the East Asian and Pacific region, the growing threat to stability and security posed by the People's Republic of China, the threat to Taiwan, but more broadly to the stability of the international system in in that region. I do not know whether he will touch on the situation in other parts of the world or America's relationships with nations in South America and Africa. 
Sometimes the president will choose to do that if there's a specific security uh, or economic issue, but otherwise not. Now that you mentioned Africa, especially the rapprochement with Africa, uh, he had a summit with the African leaders in December, and lately his, his Treasury Secretary, Ellen, the U.S. ambassador to the U.N., was in Africa. Don't you think that is... Uh, something he could maybe talk about. Uh, it was like an accomplishment. Well, it was certainly a determined push by the Biden administration to get the United States back into uh, the development of economic and political relations with Africa after a period of what I think would be fair to describe as neglect. I think most people in the administration understand that during the period of American neglect of Africa, that the People's Republic of China made a very determined push to raise its profile, especially its economic profile in Africa. Africa is the continent of the future. As populations begin to decline in Europe and in Asia, the, the wealth of young people in Africa, young talent, pools of workers uh, to be put together with investment capital to increase production, all of this suggests that that addressing relations with Africa is part, an essential part of planning for the future. But as I said, if the president mentioned everything in the State of the Union address, it would go on for hours and hours and hours. In some countries, it's okay if leaders speak for three or four hours, <laughs> yes. uh, but, not, but not in the United States. <laughs> That was William A. Galston, chair of the Brookings Institution's Governance Studies Program. He talked to me here from Washington, D.C.